obviously, uh, I'm not an independent consultant. I'm a graphic designer. Love my work. Uh, no, yes, I'm an independent consultant. Now, I was a startup CTO uh, quite a few years ago, launched a few startups. We sold one of them. Now I am an independent consultant, and I coach startup CTOs, which I really enjoy doing. But I'm actually really passionate about domain-driven design, and I'm excited to be here today to talk to you guys about it in the context of serverless architectures. Uh, I also want to start by really thanking all the organizers, AV crew, caterers, everyone that makes a day like today happen, the marketing team. It's really a lot of work, and it's uh, been an amazing day. I've really enjoyed it. And all the other speakers have been so fantastic, quite intimidating, and I've learned a lot from all of them. I hope you have too. So domain-driven design and serverless. I think they are, oh, no, I'm having the same issue Steve had. I'm going to have to stand back here. Oh, we went too far. Domain-driven design and serverless, better together. Oh, my goodness. Maybe I should just stand here and press the space bar. They will help you build more understandable, more maintainable software systems. I'm going to talk to you a bit about how they do that today. But before we get into that, probably need to explain a little bit about what domain-driven design actually is. Because in a lot of conversations I have with people, people have heard of it but aren't using it or maybe have a bit, of a, a bit scared of it, things are a bit complicated. So just as a show of hands in the room, who has heard of domain-driven design before today? Yeah, a lot of people heard of it. Who's heard about it because of microservices? No? Data mesh? Event-driven architecture? Yeah? It's involved in all those things. Who's actually doing domain-driven design? Oh, yeah, got a few people in the corner, a few wavy hands, awesome. You might actually be doing it without realizing it, because you know, it's not as scary as it first appears, as I said. But to explain it, I'm going to uh, ask you to imagine a little bit of a hypothetical world. Uh, it might be a bit of a stretch for some of you. Imagine you're a software developer, and a friend of yours comes to you and says, I want you to build me an app. Has that happened to you guys? Yeah. Leaving aside questions of appropriate compensation schemes and equity and all that sort of stuff, let's imagine you're in, you're going to do it, and your friend starts telling you about their idea. Not TikTok, very close, Pet Talk. We're going to build Pet Talk. It's just like TikTok, but for your pets. You can upload a video of your cat doing cute things. Your friends can upload videos of their pets responding to your pets. You can upload videos of your pets responding to their pets responding to your pets. It's going to make mega bucks. OK, you're a bit confused, but you've signed on for the ride, so let's go. Now, to explain domain-driven design in the context of Pet Talk, we're going to imagine that inside you there are two wolves, one with a focus on technology, one with a focus on the domain. So I imagine that the technology-focused one is probably the dominant one for most of you today. You've just been to serverless days. You're like, sweet, I've got this. going to build this system. We're going to throw an API gateway in there. We're going to throw Lambda in there. We're going to throw DynamoDB. We're going to throw a Flutter native app up the top there. Uh, we've got some video, so maybe we need Elemental Media Converter. We're going to need somewhere to store all that video, S3. Maybe a vent bridge to wire it all up as soon as the click works. And we're going to need some AI, of course. Who doesn't want AI, as we just heard on the panel today? So this is the technology focus of the architecture. You need this stuff. It's really important. I'm not saying ignore it. It's really important. But the domain focus comes at it from a different angle. You start by saying, OK, so someone uploads a video. What happens next? OK, well, we're going to notify their followers. OK, cool. So we've got this concept of followers. Um, and we're also going to go, we're going to analyze the video. OK, why are we analyzing the video? Well, we want to know some information about the video. What's the fur color of the pet? What kind of pet is it? Is it a cat or a dog or a porcupine? And what's the pattern of the fur? If that comes up, oh my goodness, it's terrible. And then we're going to notify those followers. OK, so we've got followers of these things. What's going on there? So yeah, some people are really into black dogs. Some people are really into striped cats. And they want to know whenever there's a new video for that type of pet. OK, sure, you guys do what you do. That's fine. I'll help you build it. So the notifications come to the user. The user views the video. Maybe they react to it, like it or something. Maybe they add a comment. OK, and then what happens? Well, then we have to update our feed algorithm, because that controls how, what videos the users see, so just like TikTok. This is a domain model. We've just used a practice called event storming to come up with a domain model, a series of events, the significant concepts in the domain that happen and how they flow from left to right through the system. What happens and what triggers the next thing that happens? So this is really just an act of domain modeling. Real event storming is usually a little bit more chaotic than that. You have 20 people in a room throwing orange sticky notes on a wall. That's why these are orange boxes in the diagram. Um, but this is an alternative architectural view of your system. It's the events in your system, the significant domain concepts. Some of you might be saying, OK, that's not a domain model. I know what a domain model is. It's got entities in it. Where are the entities, Chris? OK, hold your horses. We'll get there in a second. One of the things that's really interesting about this is it helps you identify complex concepts or confusing concepts in your domain. 
In this case, we've got two types of followers. In the context of following a person, we're going to use one approach to identify who to notify. In the context of following an attribute of a pet, we're going to use a different algorithm to work out who to notify. So this word follower could get quite confusing for people. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a boundary around each of those contexts and say, in this context, this is what the word follower means. In this other context, it means something different. This is the origin of the term bounded context. Has people have heard that term in the context of DDD? A lot of people don't realize it comes from language. It actually comes from understanding the language of the domain and looking for spaces where you can have a precise definition of those words in one context and a different definition in another context. In the rest of our system, we don't have such confusion, but we can also identify pockets of functionality that clearly belong together. And one of the powers of event storming is that by looking at the events that they can give you hints around what's a transition of responsibility from one pocket of concepts that belong together to another pocket of concepts that belong together. And this helps us identify the pockets that will reduce our cognitive load in understanding that group of concepts in isolation and separated from other sets of concepts. So perhaps we have a context around uploading the video, a context around the video analysis and the pet characteristics, and then a context around the reactions and the video feed. One of the other key insights from domain-driven design is that this bounded context model is probably wrong. You are going to learn things as you build it, as you deploy it into the market, as you get feedback from customers and as your domain experts evolve. As you learn more about the domain and as the domain changes, it will need to change. So maybe after building this, we decide, OK, we're going to have a totally different domain um, context here. Same events, but we're going to carve it up into different contexts. Maybe we'll have a media context that does everything to do with the functionality that relates to the raw video media. And then maybe a separate context for the followers, that's the same as before. But then we're going to group together these events related to the characteristics and those notifiers, maybe separate out the reaction stuff, and then put the feed algorithm in its own context because maybe we're starting to feed ad sales into that, and that's going to affect the feed algorithm. Really common with DDD to evolve and change your bounded context map, shuffling things around as you learn more about it. So, what comes next? So that was the high level, right? That's a very high level, zoomed out, abstract view of our domain model architecture. This is what happens when you zoom in. And this is where the entities come into the picture. So you have a user, they issue a command. The blue sticky is a command. It comes to uh, what we call an aggregate, the video, and the aggregate does some logic, changes some state, and then publishes an event to say, I've changed my state. The aggregate can be a bit, a bit of a confusing concept when you first come across it, but really it's just either a single entity or a cluster of entities that belong really closely together. You know, we talked about grouping things that belong together into a bounded context. If there's a few things that really, really closely belong together, then you put them into an aggregate, and that means that they are transactionally consistent. The aggregate, every change inside that aggregate has to happen within a single write, a single transaction. Anything else that happens after you publish an event is going to be eventually consistent. And I think Chris is going to be talking a bit about eventual consistency after me. Just a little bit, yeah. Um, a common pattern here is you publish the event, and then another aggregate in another context subscribes to that event, and then it emits another event. So that works really well. And it allows you to chain these events through your system without having any kind of orchestration, any kind of conductor issuing commands and telling people what to do. Every component is autonomous and isolated, responding to events and doing its own thing and publishing their events. This can get really complicated if you haven't done the domain analysis, because if you haven't done the domain analysis, you're going to put the wrong functionality in the wrong places. It's going to be very brittle. But if you've done a good domain analysis, it will actually work really well. Oh, I keep wandering away from the... Uh, thing. So let's just recap quickly. The, we've had the 10-minute DDD. This is a topic that takes years to master, and I've just given you the 10-minute rundown. So hopefully it's enough to whet your appetite to go and learn more about it. Bounded context, set of concepts with a pre precise meaning in that context. Um, aggregates, a little bit more complicated. Uh, a single concept that's transactionally consistent, usually reacts to events or commands, changes some state, and then publishes events. You've got those domain events, a past tense fact about something that has happened in the domain, and then commands, things that are instructions from the outside world, users or um, other external systems. Now, you'll notice in that domain model that I had up there before, there was not a single technology concept on there. There wasn't a single word that related to the technology that we're going to use. It was all just about the domain. It was the language of our users, of our stakeholders. And that's a really significant thing in domain-driven design. It's encouraging us as developers to reach out and engage and embrace the language of the domain that we're working in so that we make good decisions about the system that we're building. Because who's tried to build some software off a Jira ticket, had no idea really what the context of what's supposed to happen, and found out later that there's a so-called bug just because it wasn't explained to you what was really going on. 
this really helps with that because you do gain an understanding of the context, the understanding of what the expectations are, and you can make good decisions and you can interpret these requirements more effectively. So finally, halfway through the talk, we're going to start talking about serverless. Let's map an aggregate to the serverless components that you can use to implement an aggregate. So aggregates, as I said before, they're made up of business logic and state, functionality and data. So there's, I'm going to use the Amazon patterns because it's what I'm most familiar with, but there are services in other clouds. My apologies to all the Oracle Cloud fans here who are really hoping I'd be talking about your services. Um, but the obvious ones in Amazon are, of course, Lambda and DynamoDB. The classics, the greatest, you know, the OGT of serverless. Um, one that surprises people a little bit sometimes is step functions. They can actually be used to implement the aggregate pattern because a step each instance of the step function running is an instance of your entity or your aggregate. It actually can work. Some people use step functions as a coordinator. Fine if you want to do that, but that's not really a DDD way of thinking about things, but you can use it to implement the aggregate pattern. Of course, there's the pseudo serverless functions. I like the way Jeremy talked about that earlier today. There's like the awkwardly serverless or the you know, not really serverless serverless. I like to think about them as being serverless in the same way that my son's invisible when he's playing hide and seek and hiding behind a thin tree. We can all see him, but we pretend we can't so he doesn't get upset. Now, let's zoom into our aggregate or into our um, bounded context, perhaps. This is a diagram that comes from a pattern called the ports and adapter pattern, or the hexagonal architecture, hence the hexagon, or sometimes clean architecture. They're all subtly different, but they're kind of the same thing. Uh, you've got around the outside, can you see my light? No. You've got message handlers, API handlers, technocratic ideas that encapsulate your domain logic from the outside world, but they mediate between the outside world and your domain logic. They help you get data in, and they delegate it down to the domain logic to execute the business rules, and then it gets passed out to be stored or for other events to be propagated. This is a really powerful pattern. It helps you unit test your domain logic more effectively, and it gives you a little bit of protection. You know, if everyone's worried about you know, being trapped in a single cloud, protecting that domain logic in the middle doesn't make it that you can just lift and move it to another cloud, but it would certainly make the journey easier if you tried to migrate, because you're not going to be affecting the core business logic of your application. One of the key things here is the flow of execution from top left to bottom right, the way that things happen in sequence, is different from the flow of dependencies because the outside depends on the inside. The inside does not depend on the outside. And you can use principles like interface segregation principle um, to achieve that in IOC containers and so on. One extension to this pattern that I adopt in serverless architectures is to actually include the infrastructure definition in that boundary layer. I'll show you what that means in a second. And actually, I think, is the key to protecting you from the issue that Jeremy talked about earlier, where your application logic is starting to bleed into your infrastructure. So this is what a lot of people think that this should look like in your code base. You've got your controllers, you've got your domain, you've got your handlers and your repositories. This is not the way to do it. This might have been the way that they did it at first, but I find this to be a very technocratic view of the world. I prefer to look at things from a domain view, which means grouping things by the domain concept. You've got your comments, you've got your followers, you've got your videos, everything to do with that concept in one folder, including the infrastructure definition of the services that are going to be relevant to providing that capability. And that's what I mean by including the infrastructure in that outer layer of that hexagon. And it can actually take a dependency on your domain model. Your domain model can define an anonymous function or a lambda or something, and the infrastructure definition in CDK can take a dependency on that and pull it in and inject it into something like event bridge pipes, for example. And that helps you keep the separation of concerns and keep the business logic where it belongs, but still get deployed to the service that can make use of it. Really powerful pattern. So now we're going to talk about deployment topologies. We've got a bounded context, or so a couple of them, with a bunch of aggregates inside them. At one extreme end, I'm not saying you should do this, but you can do this. You can take all of that, build it all into one runtime process, deploy it to a single lambda. Don't lynch me. It's possible. It can work. There are environments where this is what you should do. If you're a startup with a single engineer and you don't want to be monitoring 100 lambdas and 100 dynamo tables, this is really effective. If you've carried out the logical segregation in your code base of all these domain concepts, you will then be able to, as you grow more complicated, pull them out into their own lambdas and their own dynamo tables. I've done this. It works really well. The next level down, we can pull a bounded context per lambda. Oh, we went too far. That's totally fine, too. Similar kind of pattern, except you're just making it more granular. You can go even more granular by going down to um, yeah, individual aggregates in their own lambda. And you can go even more granular by say, spreading an aggregate out and having each handler in its own lambda, the API handler in one lambda, the message handler in another lambda. Typically, your domain logic is shared between them. I find a really simple way to do this is actually deploy the same code to all the lambdas, but change the entry point so that they only get invoked 
um, depending on the message that you want to handle. At this point, you can't split the data any further because an aggregate, by definition, is a transactionally consistent set of data. It kind of all has to go into the same table. So that's an aggregate, a ton of different ways. In the context of that diagram, what even is a microservice, right? It doesn't really mean anything. You should be thinking about domain concepts and then flexible deployment topologies for those domain concepts, depending on your non-functional requirements, your team structure, your cost budget, your um, you know, other aspects of non-functional requirements that you want to worry about. So that's aggregates and bounded context. Now I'm going to talk about events. How do we map them into serverless architecture? Well, much like an aggregate has logic and state, um, events have schema and transport. You've got to define what the event looks like, the shape of the event, and you've got to have services that can move the event around between components. Some really common ones in Amazon are the SNS-SQS combination, which I really like, and of course, EventBridge, the new kid on the block. So let's just have a look, quick, quick look at schemas. Um, this is super annoying. Where are we going here? So if you are using the same programming language across your whole system, Look, just push the types that define your events into a separate package and take a dependency on that package from either co other contexts. Bob's your uncle. You've got the schemas in all the places they need to be. This separation ensures that your context B can subscribe to events coming from context A without having taken a binary dependency on the business logic of context A, which you really want to avoid. If you're not using type languages or using different log um, languages, you can use EventBridge schema registry. No problems there. But one thing to just keep in mind is the owner of the schema. The schema is owned by the publisher. One risk with pushing it into EventBridge registry, um, schema registry is that because it's centralized, you start to lose sight of who owns the schema. The publisher has to own the schema. It's not a contract negotiation. The publisher is the authority on that schema. Other people are takers of the schema. So the common deployment topology for events with an SNS SQS is you have one topic per event, and you have one queue per lambda. So in the monolithic lambda, you probably just have one queue. You could have more if you wanted to, but you probably just have one. Once you spread it out, you need a queue per lambda. But the queues can then subscribe to the topics that relate to the events that they're interested in. If you have another event, it gets its own topic, and the same queue can subscribe to multiple topics, as long as your lambda has got um, in logic in that boundary layer of the hexagonal architecture to route the message to the appropriate handler. Event bridge works very similarly, but um, there's some real key differences to keep an eye on. So you've got a publisher pushing events into EventBridge, and you've got subscribers subscribing. But the way they designed EventBridge, the, the routing happens managed centrally inside EventBridge, which is a little bit different because the subscriber kind of loses a little bit of control. But the answer to that is to go back to this point about putting the construct logic right next to your domain logic so that that folder, which contains everything to do with that aggregate, is owns and is responsible for the definition of the EventBridge rule so that it is responsible for that subscription. And it controls whether the subscription exists, exists where it should go um, and what the target of that rule is. If you want to use EventBridge pipes, go for it. Really powerful. But similarly, the definitions of the transforms and the filters should belong to the subscriber. Don't get caught in the trap of mixing that logic um, into some separated infrastructure logic everywhere. Because as Jeremy said, you end up with your application logic bleeding all over the place, and it's a disaster. But this pattern solves that completely, and it's really effective. Um, so another thing, and this relates to what Eric um, was talking about with item potency. If you're doing two things in your Lambda, you have a risk. If you're pushing data into Dynamo and you're publishing an event, one might succeed, the other might fail. Item potency can help, but it can only take you so far necessarily, because those power, um, the power tools keep track of the response, but they don't necessarily keep track of outbound events that have been dispatched. And so you might end up with duplicate events, and maybe they don't have the same item potency ID, which means you might get double handling on the other end. One thing that you can do to resolve that is to leverage DynamoDB streams, because they will only get dispatched if the commit of the data to DynamoDB was successful. And as long as your um, functional flow is such that the commit to DynamoDB is the last thing that happens and nothing else can go wrong after it, then you can be pretty confident that the event is going to be consistent with the business data. Phantom message is a disaster. Can you imagine if you didn't commit the fact that a transaction had happened, and yet you published the event that allows the item be shipped? You didn't charge the customer, but you shipped the item. Terrible outcome. So with EventBridge, sorry, with um, DynamoDB Streams, you can push that out to another Lambda. I think that that Lambda should also belong to that aggregate folder because it's responsible for translating private event, which is the DynamoDB Stream data packet, because that's private to the aggregate, into a public event that can then get pushed into EventBridge or anywhere else that you want it to go. And the public event should be in the language of the domain. It should not be a data capture event because that is private to the schema of that aggregate. And if you start bleeding that out, then you've so, so all of a sudden coupled other services to the private schema um, of the data storage of your aggregate, which is, again, another coupling issue. Um, 
Again, you can use um, event bridge pipes to do that, but unlike last time where I said that the event bridge pipes, filters, and transforms should belong to the subscriber, in this case, because they're transforming that data ch capture um, change event into a public event, that definition should belong to the publisher in this case. I hope that makes sense. Uh, where are we? Went too far. So that's been a really quick sort of whetting of the appetite of domain-driven design and how you can use it in serverless architectures. If you found any of that at all interesting, very happy to have a chat with you at the pub afterwards. Um, we're also kicking off a new meetup called Domain-Driven Design Australia. First one's going to be in Sydney in March 22. Second one in April will be in Melbourne. We're going to TikTok back and forth, and there'll be a live stream for all of them. So if you're not in the city that it's in, you can still watch the live stream. Um, I think it's going to be really exciting. I encourage you to check it out and um, join the live stream or come along and join us. It should be fun. Um, if the stuff that I talked about in relation to like, precise language of the domain was interesting to you, you might be interested in this um, little open source project I've been working on. It's called Contextive. Um, it's a tool where you can put a YAML file in your repository that captures those domain terminologies, the key concepts in your domain. And once that YAML file is there, when you're working on the code, it'll surface those terms in your autocomplete and in your hover definitions so that you can be constantly reminded of what is the business definition of this terminology. And because it's captured in a separate file, not in a code comment, it will get surfaced everywhere you see that term, in a markdown file, in front-end TypeScript, in back-end C-sharp or Java. Anywhere you see that term, in a controller, in a domain model, in a, in a front-end component, in a React component, you'll see these definitions. And it can help you align your thinking around domain concepts rather than technocratic concepts. Um, currently for VS Code, coming soon to Visual Studio and maybe IntelliJ if I can work out the Java model. I'd also really like to push these definitions out to places like Slack and Teams and Miro boards and Confluence pages with like browser extensions and Slack bots and stuff. So if you're having a conversation with your colleagues about some domain rules and some domain logic, you can have these definitions kind of gently surface to remind everyone and keep each other on the same page about what these definitions mean in what context. So anyway, if that's interesting, check out the tool, give it a try. I'd love to get some feedback. Anyone who wants to contribute to it, very welcome. It is open source. So that's been me. I hope I haven't gone too far over time. No? All good? Excellent. Thank you so much. Please come and chat to me later at the pub.